Yeah, so I will go first. Um, so I think for what you can do, the first thing that I'll mention is also the most obvious, which is simply uh, to make your own research articles uh, freely available online, uh, hopefully through an open access journal uh, where possible, you know, if there's uh, a good open access journal in your discipline, that's a good fit for your work. Uh, but we certainly understand that there are cases, um, you know, where there are strong incentives to publish in subscription-based journals, uh, particularly for early career researchers that don't have tenure. Understand, you know, you have to look out for your uh, career and understand, you know, the publication choices that come from that. Um, you know, but just encouraging people to make copies of their articles uh, freely available through e-scholarship or other repositories like PubMed Central um, when, when possible, and hopefully publishing in journals that allow for that, or even, um, you know, where you don't get as much, uh, don't have as many rights uh, sort of retained in the author agreement, trying to actually amend um, your copyright transfer agreement or your publication agreement with publishers to reserve more rights. And actually, Spark has an entire toolkit uh, called the Spark Authors Addendum um, that's uh, essentially stock language that you can use to attach to your publication agreement to try to reserve more rights and there's sort of uh, a menu of options that you can choose from in terms of the rights that you want um, to retain and so that's all available on the Spark website uh, at spark.arel.org. So the first one, uh, probably the most important. Yeah, and similarly for uh, educational resources, thinking about ways that, that you can support uh, the creation and, and sharing and improvement of, of openly licensed educational materials. And uh, really, if, if, if you go and look for open educational resources on the web, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, so I mentioned a number of projects that are supporting the development of these materials, and there's just so much available out there right now. And it's, it's not particularly well organized and connected. Um, so I think that uh, one of the reasons that, that I left my previous job to come work with Spark is that there is huge potential for the library community to, to get involved and help connect and organize this information. Of course, you know, there are a lot of great people leading the way on initiatives to, to work on this, but I think we have a lot, um, uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, progress to make there. And then just from the individual's perspective, if you're a faculty member, a student, and you want to find an open educational resource for your course, um, this, may, this may look familiar if you tried to do that. <laughs> so some of the things that are happening on campuses and that you might consider doing um, are, are programs to support uh, faculty to identify open educational resources. So I, I want to highlight one example, and of course UCLA has very successfully implemented a, a similar program, um, but I want to highlight uh, the, the UMass program because we have really strong efficacy data on it. Um, so the UMass Libraries launched a program a few years ago uh, to work with faculty who wanted to switch from expensive traditional textbooks to open materials uh, to, uh, to uh, essentially identify materials to replace everything that their textbook did. Provided many grants to support the faculty's time and uh, over the course of the past three years have been able to save students over a million dollars just at that one campus by working with faculty members. Um, so it's just a really exciting and inspiring project and, and UMass and Temple University were the ones that kind of pil pi uh, piloted it and a number of other campuses have uh, uh, taking up similar projects, including UCLA. Um, and not, uh, I believe there was one, I, I met with Sharon this morning, and it sounds like there was one course that saved students over $40,000 in one quarter uh, through 50,000, 50, <laughs> through what the library was able to do. So that's one course in one quarter. Uh, that's amazing work. And just think how much potential there is. Uh, in courses like chemistry, uh, where there are over, you know, sometimes a thousand students taking intro chem in one particular semester or quarter. So another way to support kind of the finding and, and, and evaluation of quality of materials, because that's a really important too, uh, is a, a pro project out of the University of Minnesota called the Open Textbook Library. Uh, which has been curating a list of open textbooks that uh, meet a, a minimum standard of quality uh, objectives. And what they've actually been doing is collecting reviews from faculty members about uh, uh, what the features of the book are um, and uh, what, as a subject matter expert, uh, they think of, of its coverage um, of the particular course. 
And this is a very easy thing that some of you could do who, if you're faculty members, uh, is to contribute a re review to this project um, or encourage faculty members you know to review an open textbook. You can visit the website open.umn.edu to identify materials that might be options to review um, and submit the reviews there. Uh, and just to provide one example, I showed this book earlier. Um, it gets a five and a half, four and a half star rating, which is pretty good. Um, and then uh, the reviews look like this. They're written by professors and they're different categories and they write little comments in it. So it's really useful uh, for evaluating the quality of these materials. And then just one really interesting thing about reviews is that it, the University of Minnesota's pilot of this, uh, they funded 11 faculty to write reviews for the catalog. And what ended up happening is seven out of 11 of those professors ended up picking the book that they reviewed. So it was just a matter of you know, raising awareness and, and supporting the faculty member to take the time and, and look, at, look at a book that um, maybe they wouldn't have heard of without this project. And the really interesting thing is that those seven faculty members convinced five of their colleagues to also adopt open textbooks and it ended up saving students over $100,000 in the first year of the project. So just a really great example. And then uh, finally about just you know, making the resources around you open, I think just think about the question, what content is being produced on this campus? And how can we make it open? Are there professors that are willing to make their materials open? And what can you do to support that? Um, and I just want to quickly plug, UCI has a great program um, on open, an open courseware program like MIT's to support that. So um, moving on to uh, other things you can do, I think the most central thing is, is and perhaps easiest um, from, uh, uh, for anybody to do is to raise awareness of these issues. I think you know, right now we're at a place where they're just starting to um, gain visibility uh, in the public and, and as a household term. And uh, something that you can all do is walk away from this presentation and talk to your colleagues about openness and, and the value and the impact that it is. And um, for open education, a great time to do that is during Open Education Week, which happens in March. And then I know that many of you know Open Access Week, uh, which is a, a longer standing week that Nick's going to talk about in a second. Um, and uh, another option is uh, Spark has set up uh, a listserv uh, to specifically for the library community to support conversations about OER. Um, so uh, if you're interested, that's a great place to uh, gain resources and connections to support uh, raising awareness. So for open access, a uh, little surprise, we have lots of Spark resources to help people uh, you know, have conversations around open access. And my personal favorite, uh, probably because I helped put it together, uh, is uh, a video that we did uh, in partnership with PhD Comics, uh, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, it's uh, an eight and a half minute video called Open Access Explained. Uh, and this is a short link for it, uh, but I think it does a pretty good job sort of explaining what open access is, why it's important, sort of how it's come uh, about and sort of looking to uh, the future that we actually, uh, the other, I guess my co-presenter in the videos, uh, Jonathan Eisen, uh, who's actually at, in the UC system at, at Davis. Uh, and so I think it's a pretty useful uh, tool to sort of share with folks that, uh, you know, maybe not as familiar with open access, um, you know, since uh, I think it could be a bit onerous to maybe write somebody sort of like a, a Russian novel length email about what this is what open access is, this is why it's important, this is how you make an article open. This is sort of an attempt to distill that down into uh, eight minutes. And we've been really pleased with uh, how popular it's been. It's um, gotten uh, a little bit over 200,000 views on YouTube now, um, which is pretty good for an eight and a half minute long video about scholarly publishing. Uh, so we're excited about it. I hope you'll check it out um, if you haven't already. Um, also, uh, one thing you can do uh, in terms of awareness raising um, is to talk to uh, faculty uh, here and the UC system about the UC system-wide open access policy. Uh, you know, we've, I guess this is our third stop now, um, you know, and it seems like, um, you know, there's uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of conversations that people could have to clear up misconceptions or misunderstandings about what the policy is, 
Um, you know, and, and these are common across all campuses, really, that have these policies, you know, concerns over uh, the limitation of publication venues for authors, which, you know, the, the UC uh, policy has an opt-out clause, so it's not a problem, but oftentimes uh, can be perceived as one. And so I think, uh, you know, having these, these conversations with colleagues and across campus and having events uh, like this can help advance that policy and actually make it more effective more quickly. One of the things that we've seen with institutional open access policies is that oftentimes it actually takes a while to get them uh, to you know, be effective in making all of the campus's research output freely available. Uh, this is some data again from uh, the Queensland University of Technology showing how in the first year of implementing their institutional policy, they uh, were getting about half of their faculty's research output uh, freely available online. And then you know, it took them about eight years to get up to about 90%. Um, you know, and we'd love to see, uh, you know, that rise much more quickly and start higher, um, you know, within the UC system. And I think there's already uh, a lot of awareness of the policy, but having these conversations can help, you know, make sure that you start up, uh, you know, up at the top and, you know, reach 100% uh, more quickly. Uh, one other thought is uh, to consider expanding the UC uh, system-wide policy uh, to include graduate students as well. One of the most interesting things we saw uh, last year in our work with students was uh, the PhD candidates at the Stanford Graduate School of Education uh, passed uh, a resolution by 97% margin to expand their institutionals, uh, their institution's open access policy to cover PhD candidates. And I know that that was actually something that was discussed uh, when the uh, original UC system-wide policy um, was being put together. Uh, and actually know a few graduate students that sort of spearheaded the advocacy to include graduate students in the policy. Um, you know, and unfortunately that didn't work out, but I think it would be great to, to ex expand that or at least have the conversation uh, around expanding that so that graduate students sort of uh, get into the habit of making their work freely available, um, you know, as they're becoming, um, you know, full-fledged scholars. Then lastly, the uh, sort of great time to promote open access is during International Open Access Week, which I know uh, you've celebrated here for a number of years. Uh, I have to point out that this is actually something that was started by students. Uh, in 2007, students partnered with Spark for a National Day of Action uh, for Open Access uh, in the U.S., and it's really exploded since then to an international event that's celebrated, uh, I think, in nearly 100 countries. Uh, you know, it's a really, really diverse group that, that celebrates this each year. Uh, and actually, uh, just last week, we announced the theme for this year, uh, which will be Generation Open, and we'll focus on the importance of engaging students and early career researchers uh, you know, on open access and their importance as the future of the academy and actually making uh, the shift to a fully open system of scholarly communication. And we'll also talk about what open access means to researchers and scholars at different stages of, of their career. So we're really excited uh, for Open Access Week this year, particularly I am for the theme for obvious reasons, but uh, we'll think it'll be great. And we're going to have a webcast actually uh, next Monday that's a kickoff webcast for planning open access at weeks events where we'll have uh, someone from the UC system representing <coughs> all the great events that have happened across uh, the UCs during this week. Uh, and I think sort of naturally leads to the importance uh, of really putting the next generation uh, at the center of all the efforts uh, you know, that we have to promote both open access and open educational resources really as the people you know, that will see this project through uh, to completion and whose choices the ultimate success of both of these movements will really ultimately rely on. And we've seen incredible work uh, that students have done. A couple that I'll mention just briefly. Uh, the first is uh, a series of events the Medical Student Association of Kenya did in, to, in 2012 in celebration of Open Access Week. They held events on, I think, nearly every single medical campus in the country uh, and in one week managed to educate nearly half of all Kenyan medical students about open access. Uh, they also reached a lot of faculty and administrators uh, at their universities and were actually instrumental in passing an institutional open access policy at the University of Nairobi about a month after this happened, um, which I think speaks volumes to the power of students. And we actually know from uh, talking with the librarians that they worked with that the administration uh, really started to see the issue differently once the students became active. And that's uh, something that we've seen on other campuses. Uh, I've heard similar feedback from, for example, the University of Colorado, uh, where they've had a lot of uh, engagement from there. Uh, student government, which I think in some ways having conversations earlier today with uh, student government representatives is in many ways similar in terms of the power that student government on that campus has uh, as they do uh, here as I understand. Uh, but I've also mentioned the, the impact students have had on the you know, policy making for open access at the state and federal level. 
And then lastly, one of the cool things about working with students is that you have no idea what they're going to do. Uh, you know, they have immense amounts of energy, creativity, and passion. And that really manifests in some really interesting projects. And the most, uh, I guess I can't say the most, well, maybe it is. Uh, it's like choosing a favorite child, I think. Uh, one extremely, extraordinarily interesting project that was uh, led by two medical students from the UK uh, who started off not knowing what open access was and in nine months built uh, this platform called the Open Access Button uh, that a few of you may have, have heard of. Uh, it's essentially a, a browser-based tool that for the moment resides in your bookmark bar. And so uh, when you uh, are browsing online, I'll do a demo, uh, and uh, when you hit a paywall, you click the Open Access Button and it generates uh, this beautiful map of all the different places where people around the world that are using the tool uh, have hit paywalls. Uh, so this was originally uh, sort of envisioned as a way to raise awareness of the tremendous you know, number of people that hit paywalls uh, you know, on, a, on a daily basis. So the way it works, as I alluded to, is you're doing your research, you come across an article that looks good, you click to read the full text, and then you run in straight into the paywall, uh, where for this particular article you'd have to pay $35 for 48 hours worth of access. Oh. I wonder, yeah. you do the math for what it would cost to run this article for 180 days. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, when you do this, you click the open access button up at the top, and it creates this little pop-up that automatically scrapes the DOI, the title, uh, the URL of the article, and actually allows you to, uh, to enter why you're looking for the article. You can see the uh, medical student flare that's uh, <laughs> the autofill thing that's the default that they're trying to save lives, damn it. Um, but it's really interesting, actually, to see the stories that they've collected with this uh, and to see the ways that people are using um, you know, the academic and research literature um, that you wouldn't necessarily uh, think of. So you hit submit. Uh, it sends the data back to the project so they you know, map your, your paywall hit. Uh, and then actually it tries to connect you with a freely accessible copy of that article uh, that's available online. So right now uh, it's fairly rudimentary. Uh, it just searches Google Scholar by the article <coughs> DOI and by the title of uh, the article. Um, so it essentially takes a couple steps out of what I think a lot of people do when they hit paywalls. Uh, but there's some really, really interesting uh, sort of additions to the project. This is just a beta, uh, and we're uh, sort of in the process of building uh, a much more fully functional uh, piece of code. And I think one idea that illustrates how powerful this could become is uh, a bit of code that they're almost done with uh, that would, whenever somebody uses the button, would automatically send an email to the corresponding author saying, hey, somebody's trying to read your article but couldn't get access to it. This is terrible for you, but if you send us a link to your article where it is freely available online, like in an institutional repository, we'll make sure this doesn't happen again. And so the next time somebody hits the paywall and uses the button, it will automatically serve them the link to that article that they ingested from the author. Uh, there are also discussions about partnering with repositories um, to sort of bulk ingest uh, the DOIs and the corresponding URLs for where you can get free text. Um, so this could potentially become a really, really powerful tool and was built uh, by two medical students who don't know how to code and didn't know what open access was at the beginning who recruited uh, a community of coders uh, to put this thing together. And when you actually zoom in, uh, it can be incredible to see, you know, when it's actually put to use, um, you know, in places like libraries where people are using it often, uh, the sort of explosion of, of paywalls that happen. This one's from London. Um, but really is just uh, truly incredible. Um, as a steering committee member, uh, I guess both of us are, of this project, uh, there's actually a crowdfunding campaign that's currently underway uh, to fund uh, sort of the beginning of the, the next generation of development for this. Uh, that's sort of a, a bridge fund for uh, until the project can get a larger uh, sort of grant uh, from a bigger institution. So that's underway and uh, definitely expect to hear big things. It's an exciting project and I think a perfect illustration of uh, really how students can change the conversation. And this is already having uh, you know, a tremendous impact. It was covered by The Guardian and Scientific American uh, when it launched and has been you know, mentioned by people like the Dutch State Secretary for Science. So it's really getting some visibility. So, and similarly with, <laughs> with open educational resources, you know, the, the energy and passion of students to drive forward a system that makes more sense to them, uh, where they can get affordable access to the materials they need. and. Uh, not get ripped off by publishers, um, has produced so many interesting um, uh, uh, projects and ideas over the years. I'll just give a couple of quick examples. Um, earlier this year, the student PERGs, including CalPERG, organized 
a campaign called Textbook Broke, where they had students across the country uh, take pictures of themselves, you know, holding signs saying, I uh, paid $1,000 for my textbook this semester. I'm textbook broke. <laughs> and tweeted it out. Um, and they, gosh, they got thousands of tweets. Uh, and what was really interesting, um, and tons of national media coverage, and what was interesting is that shortly after this project, we got a whole slew of co-sponsors on federal legislation supporting open textbooks. So that had a, like a tangible impact um, on, on national politics. Another cool example was a, a few years ago, actually the last time I was here at UCLA, uh, was a campaign called the Textbook Rebellion. Um, where uh, we stopped at 40 campuses across the country, starting at the University of Maryland and ending at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, with these two giant mascot costumes um, on each campus, raising awareness and collecting petition signatures that helped work with uh, reach out to faculty um, to send them information about open textbooks. Um, and uh, finally, uh, the, uh, the student pergs uh, a few years ago launched a, a faculty statement on open textbooks uh, that's been signed by over 3,000 professors uh, that are willing to consider using open textbooks whenever academically appropriate. And this actually helped uh, get the idea of open textbooks into the national conversation about textbook affordability. So, you know, students, they're the next generation, they're the people that we preserve knowledge for and, and create institutions of higher education for. Um, so uh, as, as we're thinking about openness and how to, how to change the system we use for scholarly communication, I think putting students at the center of that is really important. And I guess one last yes. thing. I'd yes, do it. Just want to um, you know, really thank um, the libraries because I mean, you're the ones that support uh, our work. We're hopefully representing um, you know, your voice and that. So we want to work closely with you to make sure, um, you know, we're advancing your priorities, um, you know, and it's, you know, only with your support. And I think every UC library, I believe, is a member of Spark, uh, um, close to it, um, you know. So uh, uh, we really, really deeply appreciate it. Um, so. And thank you to UCLA yeah. libraries for bringing our tour. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>